start on this. Okay, should be all set. Got it. Yay. All right, so we are here um, on our curriculum meeting today, March, sorry, it's not March yet, February 13th, 2024. Um, Katie Vitro cannot make it to our meeting today, but we have our lovely Chris Rohde. Thank you for coming, Chris. Sure. Um, I had questions about our Gates program. Um, so in short, that's gifted and talented education. Um, right. And I feel like I don't know anything about our Gates program and, and I'm probably one of many. Um, I don't know if anybody, if, if too many people in the Scarborough School District parents that are, that is, if they know much about the Gates program. Yep. Um, so just give us, give us some info uh, about the program. What I have outlined in our agenda is um, what are the misconceptions on what it means to be gifted? Because I know that there's certain criteria that mm -hmm. need to be met in order for anyone to be in the Gates program. Um, and then how the kids are identified, who assesses them, and if this is available at all levels, yep. um, and what additional programming is offered to our exceptional students currently, and what family supports there are for our students in Gates. So take it away, Chris. All right. So just to start with um, kind of a general overview, um, we currently have um, approximately 200 kids. I think our current count is 201 students. Um, that are receiving services through our activist program. And um, I'll give you the breakdown in a couple of minutes on you know, what that looks like for the different areas of the different schools. Uh, but in general, um, the way the process works is formal identification and provision of services begins with students in third grade. So okay. for kids in kindergarten, first and second grade, um, there's some informal consultation, and that's provided by our uh, Gates teacher at uh, the Wormworth School. Um, her name's Claire Ledoux. And uh, so she can do some informal consult um, and some in-classroom enrichment with uh, students and working with teachers at the K-2 level. And um, this would be based primarily on um, two sources of information. One would be results on iReady assessments, and the other would be um, uh, you know, just teacher recommendations. Okay, so Claire's available on an informal basis for that. Um, starting in third grade, identified students can receive services for uh, language arts, um, <clears throat> math, and also uh, visual arts, as opposed to music. And uh, those services can continue from third grade all the way through to graduation. Um, one change that happens when we get to sixth grade in middle school is that we also include um, music as an area that we identify students for, as well as science and social studies. And I'll talk a little bit more about what those services look like in a minute. Um, okay. So that's just kind of a, a broad overview, right, of the sort of the grade span and the different areas that, um, that we look at. So in terms of, of numbers, um, right now at, um, I'll start with Wentworth. So at Wentworth, we have 19 students receiving um, Gates and Language Arts, uh, 14 in math, uh, two in visual arts. Um, at the middle school, we have 20 students identified for Language Arts, 23 for math, uh, 10 for science, 11 for social studies, 19 for art, 12 for music. And then at the high school, we have uh, 34 in language arts, 55 for math, 32 for science, 13 for social studies, 45 for art, and 17 for music. Um, so would it be helpful for me next just to, to kind of talk about a brief overview of what the service model looks like, 3 through 12, and then I can talk about identification after that? Yeah. Well, before you get into that, can you can you tell me why K through 2 is, I mean, it's it's informal consultation versus a formal consultation and then get into the rest of that stuff. Yeah, 
That's a great question, Jenna. That's that's been the model as long as I've been here. So this is my second year, as you know, in the role as director. So I mean, I yeah. As assistant director, I didn't really work with the Gates program, um, and that's um, a question I haven't actually asked the Gates team. So I can go back and get some information on that. Um, yeah. I'm not sure, but that that has been our model. I know for um, as long as I've known about it. So um, yeah, I can check that out and get some answers for you. And and who who is on the Gates team? Who are these people? Yeah, so we have uh, Claire Ledoux is our Gates teacher at Wentworth. Um, we have uh, Jessica Kelly and um, Carrie Ellen Avery are at the middle school. Carrie Ellen covers uh, math and science, um, and they, uh, Jessica does the um, uh, language arts for us. And then at the high school, we have uh, John York is our uh, Gates teacher. There. Okay. Uh, so any other questions, Jenna, before I kind of jump into what the, what the service model looks like at the different phases? Um, not yet. Carolyn, do you have any questions before Chris jumps in? I don't. I wasn't okay. fast enough writing down all the all of the, your your stuff. So I'm hoping, Jenna, I hear you typing. So I'm hoping you uh, you're a faster typer than I am a <laughs> typer. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to keep track of the minutes too. So yeah. putting in as much as I can. <laughs> That's awesome. Good. No, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. So, and again, this is just an overview, but starting in third grade, um, identified students, if they're identified for, for language arts, I'll start with that. Um, Claire uses a model where um, students in third grade would come to get some additional work. In other words, they'd be in their regular reading class. But then in addition to that, twice per week, they would work with Claire in a rise block. Claire would also provide some uh, enrichment you know, to the teacher as well if they need to for the day-to-day -day and stuff. Uh, in fourth grade, um, similar model, but Claire will pull students uh, three days per week during the ride block uh, for her direct instruction. Again, also working with the classroom teacher. And then in fifth grade, um, Claire will um, uh, be the teacher of record for those students. So they'll work just with Claire for about an hour a day uh, during that during that reading block. Um, for math, um, it's a little bit different because students will, will pretty quickly start to accelerate um, beyond the grade level math instruction. So Claire does a full out model um, for math with acceleration starting in third grade. So that looks a, a little bit different. Um, and then the visual arts piece is, um, you know, basically some consultation with the art teachers, maybe um, some differentiated projects for kids or a little bit of extra time um, to work on, on, on that stuff. Um, okay, and then going to middle school. So similarly, math is um, an accelerated model. So um, students in the Gates math program would uh, basically complete, um, you know, try to complete geometry. Uh, by the end of their eighth grade year. And um, that is uh, a full out model for that. Our um, language arts model is um, more of what I would call kind of an inclusion model, I guess. Uh, Jessica Kelly, who's the language arts teacher, goes into um, the, uh, the, the uh, LA class and provides services to kids in that setting as, a full, as opposed to a full out setting. And so that's our model for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And Jessica will work with um, you know small groups of kids in that setting, um, differentiating. Uh, for example, if the students are working on a, a reading passage, uh, Jessica will work with the kids to just take like the level of analysis and thinking on that to a deeper level than we might expect for for students in the general education um, program. Um, and then um, for the uh, high school, um, we have for ninth and 10th grade, there is a Gates um, ELA class. And then after that, um, students have the opportunity to take uh, AP English for 11th and 12th grade. Uh, that class is, is really, um, the 11th and 12th AP classes are open to um, any students who, who can 
you know, uh, meet that level of rigor. Um, it's not restricted just to Gates students. So it's a little bit different at the right. And then for math, um, similarly, we don't have a quote unquote Gates math class, but students, the typical path would be students who complete geometry in eighth grade would start with algebra two um, at the high school. We have had, I think, a, a small number of students who may have jumped like right to pre-calc. Some of those kids may do the um, the algebra two piece over the summer before freshman year. That's been a pretty small handful of kids. So the typical path would be to um, uh, start with um, algebra two as a freshman, and that would allow students to get um, to uh, a calculus. Um, by their senior year. So, um, and then for the visual and performing arts at the high school, uh, again, it's um, for music, students might participate in all state or district um, festivals. Um, occasionally there might be a private lesson involved for a student. Um, art, it tends to be more kind of individual projects. Um, we do a field trip typically around that every year. Um, kids might participate in a workshop at Mecca. So again, it's a little more individualized, right, depending on what the student's uh, strength is um, in that point. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of a, a, a really quick overview of what the uh, service model looks like 3 through 12. So let me pause there. Any questions around that piece? Um, I have a question. So, so let's say, you know, it's just a specific subject like math in third grade, and it's a it's a pullout model. You said, yep. are are the parents or the families usually notified of these first before before they do these programs, or are they or teachers just kind of recognize that this child needs um, a little bit more challenging work in math, and then they they kind of bump them to these classes. Yeah, a great question. And um, it might make sense for me to talk a little bit about the eligibility criteria. Um, okay. That, I think we'll kind of answer that question, Jenna. So, okay. so we do have a formal identification process for Gates. And this does make, you know, um, students working through the Gates program, that's probably the biggest difference as opposed to kids getting differentiation and enrichment from the general education teachers, right? So the, the basic piece that we're looking for, for both um, uh, language arts and math, is we start with um, uh, an achievement screener. So for second graders in the spring of second grade, it would be the level assessment. And then moving forward from there, it would be the, um, uh, the NWDI, which, which we're now giving twice per year, right? That's our main state assessment, given in the fall and the spring. So we use that as a screening tool, and what we're looking for are students who are scoring in the 98th percentile or above um, on either the language arts or portion, or for some kids, both. So when we have a student who has met that um, initial screening criteria, the next step is um, the Gates uh, team will check in with a classroom teacher and, and you know, get um, some thoughts on what the student's day-to-day -day performance looks like. Um, and then we would reach out to parents to see if they are interested in us doing the second step of the screening, which would be to provide uh, an assessment called the COGAT, which is uh, essentially like a cognitive assessment. Um, okay. And we look at, uh, again, uh, a score of 98th percentile or above as kind of that final piece of, of eligibility. And okay. for... Um, for language arts, um, we're looking for a 98th percentile or above on um, what's called the verbal battery of the COGAT. And um, for math, we're looking at a 98th percentile or above on the quantitative um, composite score. So um, so you don't have to get like a 98th percentile higher COGAT. We're looking at those specific areas because the thinking is that that aligns kind of most closely with that underlying academic skill. Um, and just a, a quick note on that, we we have um, had some changes right here in Maine around our, our Maine state assessments over the past four or five years. And so, mm -hmm. um, and then the other piece that we are doing this year is we're moving to the most recent version of COGAT, which is a COGAT 8. 
And okay. so part of what we will look at, and by we, I mean myself, um, Katie Vitro will be involved as well, and the, uh, our Gates teachers. Um, we'll look at the um, uh, kind of what the results are looking like coming back for kids, because the norming criteria might be a little bit different, right, for new assessments. So it will be a, a something for us to look at in terms of are we still capturing um, uh, our, our kid? Did, did, did the results still make sense to us as a team in terms of qualification for staying with like that 98th percentile given these new tests? So mm -hmm. that's something we would look at anytime um, we had a new assessment and we just have to one new ish one with main state uh, uh, NWA assessment and then the COGAP being an update for the previous version. So. Um, so yeah, so that is a, a snapshot. And to go back to your original question, Jenna, for sure, um, we would always, uh, you know, reach out to families to let them know, you know, your child is is you know, we want to get the COGAD. If we take the co give the COGAD and the and the student passes, then at that rate that we're looking for, then we would let the parent know that. Certainly, if a parent ever wanted to opt out, we would never, of course, you know, um, say no. You have to you have to take the the gates pass, so that's really up to families, um, and they get a, a notification about that. And then yeah. for, um, for science and social studies, um, starting in um, sixth grade, um, I think I forgot to talk about that model. That model is um, for science; it's it's project based, and um, <laughs> the gates team will meet with students in, um, during rise blocks. Usually, what the students will do is maybe take a uh, an area of interest or a project that they want to work on that's, again, related to the curriculum, but goes goes a little deeper um, than we would uh, in the regular classroom. And for social studies, um, what we've done um, the past few years has been for kids to participate in the uh, the National History Day competition. So so neither one of those are, are pullouts. Um, they're in addition to the general education um, science and social studies classes. Um, and the identification for that looks a little bit different. Um, the model for that is students need to be eligible under either uh, language arts or math. And if they are, what happens is uh, students and teachers will get what is essentially um, kind of like an interest inventory or an interest survey. And what we're looking for there is just a sense from students about whether you know, is this, let's say science, for example, is this really an area of passion for you that you want to, that you want to dig into, you know, more deeply? And in turn for teachers, what we're looking for are, you know, students who are um, not just talented, because we, you know, obviously we've got lots of talented kids here, but also kids that are, that really have a, you know, a deep interest in going further, you know, with that subject matter. So, uh, so similarly, parents would would be notified about um, eligibility decisions for that that piece as well. And the visual arts and performing arts that's um, typically portfolio based, right? As you said, so. yeah. All right, that was a very long winded answer to your question. <laughs> that's okay. I, I needed it. Okay. Do you want to jump back to to some of the other questions you had at the start? Just remind me what some of those were, Jenna, and I can speak to some of those. All right, let's see. I've kind of typed all over the place here. So um, family, family supports. Are there family supports for students uh, that are in Gates? I mean, I, I assume that, I mean, from what you're, you're explaining, that there's a lot of things related to the gen ed curriculum, but then things go a little bit deeper, but then I, you know, there might be some really exceptional uh, skills that we're looking at here. So just wondering if there are family supports for students in our Gates program. Yeah, great question. I think Jenna, that would be um, uh, mostly um, what I would characterize as informal supports, right? So okay. actually, um, had a question, for example, you know, of a let's say a family of a fourth grader with a student who was in for for language arts really wanted to know, you know, what would be some activities they could do over the summer, right, to deepen their their understanding um, and their skills. Um, that would be probably an informal conversation with Claire, you know, Ledoux, the the Gates teacher, and um, I'm um, 
obviously I'm biased. I work here. I think we have a fantastic Gates team. They're all uh, very skilled, but they're also people who are really deeply invested in the kids that they're working with. And so they would be the primary person I would point the parent to would be to say, hey, reach out and, and chat with your Gates teacher. And they would be um, a great resource. Um, they're connected um, with other Gates teachers, you know, in our Southern Maine area as well. So um, they've got a whole team of people that they can reach out to if a parent has a question and, and they don't have a ready answer for it. So they're, they're, they're a fantastic resource. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you already answered the additional programming that might be offered to our students. And then you answered how, how they're identified. Oh, I have on here misconceptions on what it means to be gifted. And maybe it's kind of a loaded question, but you know, that there is a way obviously that we identify what it means to be gifted. Um, I, you know, I, I could easily come in and say, Chris, I think my child is super bright and gifted, but you know, falls short of the criteria. So, so what, what are these misconceptions that, that parents might, might run into, you know, they think that their child is super bright, but they might not be, they might not be categorized as the gifted. Yeah. Yeah. Group. Well, I think the, you know, the, the, the first uh, response, I guess I would have to that question, Jenna would be, um, uh, you know, if you were to ask 10 different people, what does it mean to be gifted? You might get, you might get 10 different answers, right? So, so what we're thinking about here, I think in our world is um, kind of our narrow, what I would call a relatively narrow definition of gifted, right? Where we're looking at very specific achievement and cognitive criteria um, to answer that question in terms of eligible school services. Um, you know, in terms of, um, uh, how to define that more broadly? I think the other the other misperception I think that some people have is that um, um, I'm not sure everybody knows the level of differentiation, right? That that teachers do every day for kids, and I think sometimes people worry, and I certainly hear the same thing um, with one of my other hats here, right? In terms of special education services, like we'll we'll hear you know parents worry if well my student's not eligible for for Gates or for special education, that they're not going to get the the help that they need to be successful in school. And I think, um, you know, people who aren't here every day, working with our staff every day, um, may not always understand that the the tools that teachers have available um, to do a lot of that enrichment you know, for for those volunteer kids um, in the day to day work um, in the classroom and. Um, you know, we certainly will have um, students who are occasionally on, sort of officially on watch, um, I guess, for a Gates program. These might be kids, for example, who score like a 96 or a 97 percentile, let's say, in, 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 the, in the fall in WPA. So they'll be on watch with our Gates staff. They'll check in with that student's classroom teacher, um, see if they need some help with enrichment um, in those materials. So, um, so you know, there's 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 definitely other other ways that we as a school um, work really hard to make kids uh, make sure kids are getting what they need in terms of enrichment, and challenge, and and keeping them interested in what in what we're doing here today. So, um, so Jen, I don't know if that helps answer that question, or if you have any follow ups to that. I no, I don't. Carolyn, do you have any uh, additional? Uh. <laughs> sorry, sorry for my Ziggy look <laughs> that I have here today. You get me from here up. <laughs> um, but yeah, Chris, um, it, you you just hit on it a little bit. My my initial thought was, wow, ninety eight percent looking for a score of ninety eight percent seems really 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 high. And is there a reason for it to be, you know, ninety eight versus ninety five, or you know, yeah. what is that bit of a differential there? So, so part of that is, uh, Carolyn, is based on some rough guidelines that we get from Department of Education around the percentage of students that, you know, they kind of see as being like an appropriate uh, guideline for the number of kids that would be receiving services. And I don't have those numbers with me um, this afternoon. I, I want to say the state guideline is somewhere between 5 and 7% 
the student population is somewhere in there. And we're, we're typically identifying maybe a percentage point or two above that. Um, again, I don't have that number with me today. Um, I think last year we were at close to 8%, between 7 and 8%. So, um, so if we were to extend um, that percentage down, let's say to 95%, we would have, you know, a much, much higher rate of, of identification. And um, uh, that would take us pretty far out of kind of that ballpark range, right, that, that Department of Ed um, gives us. So, um, so that's that's kind of a loose guidepost for us, Carolyn, I guess, in terms of, you know, how we know that 98% um, kind of works or doesn't work. <coughs> and um, so that's, yeah, that, I think that's how I would. Yeah. So does that mean like maybe other school districts to get that percentage may have a 95% criteria um, to get the percentage of students in into the gifted program? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think if you were to do uh, a survey, and we've talked about this a little bit as a Gates team, um, if you were to look at you know other school communities in Southern Maine, you'd probably see a, a variety of different models in terms of what percentages they're looking for in terms of um, eligibility, or you know, are they looking more at what I would call more subjective measures, right? Are they looking more at teacher recommendation or portfolio work as opposed to a standardized score? Um, you know, there's advantages and, and disadvantages, I think, to all of those models. It's something that we, um, you know, in the two years I've been in this role, we've, we've, we've talked about that question um, quite a bit, and we'll continue to dialogue around that. I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, it might even be today, you know, last week or this week, um, there's, a, I think, a statewide uh, Gates meeting happening um, that our, our group is going to jump into. And one of the questions was going to be around eligibility and what schools are looking at for that. So, so there's no um, uh, there's no guideline from, from Department of Ed that, you know, you have to use, you know, the NWEA or you have to use a COGAS. So there's a lot of local discretion around um, uh how that eligibility model is, is put together. Does that help answer? Interesting to find out. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, like I said, a lot, lot of different models. Uh, I think Carolyn, to go back to your question, I, I'm pretty sure there is a district that we were talking about that may have been looking at 95%. Um, but again, it, it, it really would depend on your, you know, like what your numbers look like as a school as a whole, right? And so, yeah, no, that makes sense. All right, Jenna, were there other questions we started off with that I haven't? No, I think I think you've answered everything that I've, I've listed out here. I think the only other question that's outstanding um, is just, you know, why, why not K through two? Yeah. And, um, yeah. I mean, I can I can guess on a bunch of different answers here, but I, I won't really know until <laughs> until you kind of ask the Gates team. Um, so it'd be just interesting to find out, and I'm sure you can just kind of email email it to me and Katie, and and I'll report back on the next on the next meeting. Because um, I know you're very busy. I don't need to to have you on here for an hour long meeting for a, maybe a. a two minute answer. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's okay. I can, uh, why don't I email the team, Jenna, and uh, get their thoughts on that. And then I'll try to get something back to you before the end of the week. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Uh, any other questions I can answer around Gates? I don't think I have any around Gates. Um, Carolyn, are you? Yeah, I think I'm all set. Else? I was very, well done and very interesting. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to happy to share the information. Like I said, we've got um some some really great programs here, and uh, it was nice to have an opportunity to talk about them or brag about them a little bit. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm glad. Thank you for coming on, Chris. All right. My pleasure. Have a good afternoon. All right. Thank you, you as well. Bye -bye. We'll see you later, Jenna. Oh, so now I'm 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 gonna oh. end right. So.
Yes. The whole and then you can pass. save it onto the cloud. Oh. Okay. It'll give you it'll give you have, an option to save it. Yep. I'm gonna have somebody here help me with that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thanks. All right. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.